Good morning, everyone. We're thankful that you're here today. We're thankful for those that are worshiping at home. We appreciate them as well. We hope that everything we do today will be to the glory of God. You know, I think about what David said in, in Psalms. He said, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go up into the house of the Lord. Seeing your faces, I think you're glad to be here. Our prayer is that before long we can be back where we were and be sitting closer together and not have all this separation. But we're thankful that we're able to be here today and we're glad that you're here and have chosen to be here. I'll read the order of service. It's the same as we've been doing it every, each and every Sunday. We will have a prayer, three songs, Preaching, Brother Lyle Miller will be the speaker of the morning. We'll have an invitation song, communion. Then we'll have a dismissal prayer. And we'll have a song after that for those that would like to leave before everyone else gets up. Also, I wanted to make uh, you aware of it. If you're not aware of it, we plan to have another service on Wednesday evening at 7.30, and we'd encourage you to come early. We thank you for being here early because that makes it much easier for everyone to be in place when the service starts. Uh, this Wednesday evening will be our regular singing night, and we, we want you to come back and be with us at that time. This evening's service, we will begin chapter studies, and we will begin with Acts, the first chapter, and Brother Andrew Francis will be the one that will be leading that study this evening. We need to remember all of those that are sick, those that are on our list. We need to remember those that have lost loved ones, the Alma family, the Couch family. And I have a word of thanks here from, from James Couch. On behalf of James McFarlane, he would like to thank everyone for the people who attended the visitation and the service for Sarah. He would also like to thank all of the singers and the people who brought food to his home. Please continue to remember James in your prayers and go by and visit him when you have the opportunity. Let's go to God in prayer at this time. Our most holy and righteous Father in heaven, we continue to thank you for this beautiful Lord's Day. God, we thank you for being our Father, for being the creator of all things, the giver of life, the giver of hope beyond the grave. Father, we're thankful for you caring for your people, those that will obey you. We thank you for that care. We thank you for caring so much that you gave your son to die upon the cross to redeem us of the sin that we so often commit. We thank you for Jesus. We thank you for the example he lived. We thank you for the love he had for you and your word and the love he had for us, for giving us that word so that we can know how to love you as he did. Father, be with each one of us today as we worship you. Help us to praise your high and holy name and help us to bring glory to you with all the things that we do here today. We pray that you'd be with Brother Lyle as he brings the lesson and help us to remember those things. Help us to carry them out in our daily lives as we study your word and, and grow from day to day. Father, we pray for all those that are listed that are sick and others that we know about. Bless them, help them to have a portion of their health if it be your will. Father, be with those that lost loved ones and comfort them as only you can. Our nation is in an uproar still today. So we pray for all leaders from our cities to the, to the state, to the, all the governors, all those that are over us, to the president and all of those, and for the elders of the churches, that that we would make decisions that would, would be in accordance with your will 
and it will bring us all back together soon. We pray for those, Father, that have gone out into the world to teach your word. We pray that they would continue to do that, bless them, help them to have courage to convert those that are lost. Help us to support them in any way that we can. Be with each member of this congregation from young to old. And we ask your blessing upon them as we serve you. We thank you for the temporal blessings of life. We won't number those things, but we know that everything that we have comes from your hand. Before we close our prayer, Father, we'd ask forgiveness. We fail you. We would ask you to help us not do that anymore. Help us to live closer to you. Finally, Father, when our life is over, give us a home with you in heaven if we've proven faithful. Our prayer in Christ's name. Amen. Number 966. 966. How can I keep from singing? Number 966. As we sing this, everybody sing out and try not to drag. There's an endless song that goes in. Forty-four, surround us, O Lord. Five, four, four. This has a tendency to be a little slow, so we're going to try to keep a little bit more lively than usual. <clears throat>
Number 504. 504. It is well with my soul. 504. We'll sing the first, third, and fourth verses. First, third, and fourth. And basses, feel free to do the uh, cues on the third and fourth. We will speed up the fourth verse. <laughs> Turn your books to page number 881. Song of Invitation will be page number 881. I am truly blessed. If you'd asked me three or four months ago about church this morning and in over the past couple of months about how things were going to evolve, I would have told you things were going to maintain steady and 
normal, but that has not been the case in my life. Things have not been normal. And so I want to talk about us this morning. Are we Christ's church? Are we part of the body of Christ? I am so proud, and I use that in a godly sense, that our church elders, our church deacons, and our church membership have weathered the storm. We've been in a storm because our life has been in a great turmoil and a great upheaval. And it, we are so blessed. Brother Van talked about unity three Sundays ago, or two Sundays ago, and we are unified. Our church leadership has used God's wisdom to bring us together in such a way that we're all comfortable and we're unified. One person has not got preeminence. We're all God's family and we are unified. Brother David talked a week ago about peace, and that is a part of God's church. That's a part of what you and I need to be each and every day. So let's talk about God's church. There's five points that I want to talk about, but before we do, I want us to realize how important the body of Christ is to Jesus Christ and to God. It's of great importance. Look with me to 1 Timothy 3, verses 14 through 15. These things write I unto thee, hoping to come unto thee shortly. But if that don't happen, and I tarry long, that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God. And so we've touched that. We're socially distanced this morning, but the singing is great. Maybe we're singing out more. Maybe, I don't know. I was afraid the singing would be affected by the distance, but it's not. And so we can overcome. We know how to behave ourselves in the house of God. That thou mayest know how to behave, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and the ground of the truth. And I think this morning, as we would brag on ourselves about everybody gets to church early. Everybody comes in happy. We are doing phenomenally well. But let's do better. Because this church, this assembly, is the pillar and the ground of the truth. Now, I need an anchor, and that's what a pillar is. It's an anchor and the ground of truth. Truth brings us in a straight path to God and makes us pleasing unto God. Now, you and I know that life has an influence against Christ's church. It's out there every day. Maybe my job, maybe my coworkers, maybe where I go to college is too far from church. You know, there's nothing wrong with sports and recreation, but very often these things really are in conflict with Christ's church. And so let's work and keep church the most important. So in the beginning, it's important what time our children, grandchildren are born where they're born, the time and the place and the name is important to us in many things in life, and that is true with Christ's church. So I want to talk about that. There's five points that I want to hit this morning, and they are by no means the entire lesson on God's church. We're just going to try to limit that to about 40, 45 minutes. So we're going to talk about the time, place, and name and how that is important to us, and it's all given to us in the Bible. It's not a mystery. It's all there. Isaiah 3, verses 2 through 3. We'll begin to talk about time, place, and name in prophecy. This was years, years before the church was established. Isaiah 2, verses 2 through 3. Remember that in the Old Testament... God's people were just the Jewish nation. It was very limited. And the God spoke to his people through prophets, 
and through one man or two men or just a few people. And this says that's all going to change. And so it shall come to pass in the last days. This is in the future. This is a long time from the time that this was being written by Isaiah, that the mountain of the Lord's house, the Lord's house, shall be exalted above the hills, and all nations shall flow into it. And again, when this was written, the Jews were the only people that were accepted by God. This was a foreign concept. All nations will flow in to the church. And many people shall go and say, Come ye, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of God of Jacob, and he will teach us of his ways. We will walk in his paths, for out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. Guess what? God's church was going to start in Jerusalem. It's talked about here in Isaiah. And so it's no mystery where God's church started. Matthew 16 and verse number 18. Peter had just confessed that Jesus Christ was the Son of God. And so Jesus says to him, Thou art Peter, upon this rock I will build my church. My church, singular, Jesus possesses it, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And so religious people in the past, some have thought that the church was built on the physical Peter. So where Peter is buried today, there is a church. But that's not what it means to you and I. It's on his confession, not upon the physical man. And the gates of hell, this church that is being taught by Jesus Christ here, built on the confession that he is the son of the living God, it's everlasting and it's indestructible. It may come and go, but it's going to be here when the Lord returns. Mark 19, verse number 1. So in Isaiah, it was way in the distant future that it was going to be established, but notice what Jesus says here. That there be some of them that stand here which shall not taste of death. They're going to be alive when they see the kingdom of God come with power. So the church was going to be established during this period of time. Go with me to, skipped it, Acts 2 and verse 47. So up until now, the church is always spoken of in future tense. But notice today, Acts 2, 47, praising God and having favor with all the people and the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. So there's the time and there's the place. This was Jerusalem. So it exists today. You and I can be proud that the Lord's church exists as it does today. And it's not still in the future as it was for those that walked prior to the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. <laughs> Hebrews 1 verses 1 and 2. God, who at sundry times and in diverse manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets. That's the Old Testament. And it's changed. It's not that away anymore. Hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath anointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds. And so scripture tells us that the universe was made by God's word. Jesus Christ is that word, and this scripture tells us about the power there is in Jesus Christ and the power that he has over his church. And so look with me to Acts 20 and verse number 28. This is written to the elders at the church at Ephesus. Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers to feed the church of God. And that takes place here. Our elders are very concerned in this church being run in a great New Testament fashion like God intends for it to be. And he said, 
This church, the church of God, not just any church, the church of God, which he hath purchased with his own blood. Now, is there anything any more precious to you and I than our blood? That is the extreme purchase price that it was purchased with Jesus Christ's blood. Ephesians 1, verses 22 and 23. And that hath put all things under his feet. God has put all things under the feet of Jesus and gave him to be head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. And so we do talk about our assembly being the body of Christ. Now, how important is that? That is very important that we behave such as the body of Christ. Let's go now to Romans 16 and verse 16. I believe I skipped Ephesians 5. Let me back up. You know, my wife, our wives, honor us by wearing their husband's name. And so we should wear the name of Jesus Christ as his body. Ephesians 5, verse number 23, For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Without him, there would have been no body of Christ or no church. And so the name is also important. Romans 16, verse 16, Salute one another with a holy kiss. The churches of Christ salute you. And so when our grandchildren are born, I want to know the name. I want to know the name. I want to know the name. And so the name is important. Let's look now to Acts 11 and verse number 26. On this occasion, Barnabas was seeking the apostle Paul, and it was for a reason. And it says, when he had found Paul, he brought him unto Antioch, and it came to pass that a whole year they assembled themselves with the church and taught much people, and the disciples were called Christians first at Antioch. First word, let's notice, assembly. And so it's important that we assemble as we have today. We need to do it within the laws and the suggestions that are given to us by our leadership, by the state. I'm thankful for that. But we need to assemble. And I didn't realize how much I needed to assemble until we couldn't assemble. And so I am extremely thankful today that we can have assembly as the church. And on this occasion, there was teaching. And on this occasion, the disciples were called Christians. And so I don't want to be a such and such Christian. I just think we need to be Christians. Nothing else, nothing less, nothing more. And so this is uh, what we have on the name. Doctrine. The church exists so that we can teach and have doctrine. Some people call this a creed. And so we do have that today. And so it's no mystery of how we're supposed to handle ourselves as far as doctrine. Got to get my notes caught up. 2 Corinthians 11 and verse number 3. You know, there's times in religious history when it was so complicated there was just one guy around that could explain God's will to us or to you or I or whatever. This was way in the past. It's not that complicated. 2 Corinthians 11 and verse 3, But I fear lest by any means as the serpent cheated Eve through his craftiness, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. I learned a long time ago that if I was studying the Bible and it began to get complicated, I was on the wrong track. When you're studying God's Word, it needs to stay simple, especially the gospel and conversion. It needs to be simple because he wanted it to be simple. 
Jude 3 is our next scripture. Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that ye should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. And so what does common mean? It's a lot for all of us. As I've already stated, our elders work on unity. And Christ taught that it is God's will that his church have things as much alike and the salvation that you and I have is common. It's not different for each and every one. It's the same. And so let's work towards common. It's a salvation that was once delivered to the saints. And so it's not some newfangled deal. It's what we find here in the New Testament. Real simple, real common, real once delivered. And so that is the way doctrine of the New Testament church is. 2 Timothy 3, verses 16 and 17. Scripture is a huge blessing because it is given. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God. It's profitable for doctrine. It's profitable for reproof. It's profitable for correction. It's profitable for instruction in righteousness. What's left? Nothing. Because with the Scripture, the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Now, I'm not perfect. Neither are you. But we can be perfectly informed about all good works through the Scripture because it covers everything. The entire Bible is provided for my sake and your sake, for our learning. And so let's look now to 2 Peter 1 and verse number 3. According as his divine power, God's power hath given unto us all things. Nothing else is needed that pertain unto life and godliness. Our day-to-day -day lives should be governed by God. Our spiritual lives should be governed by God. It's through knowledge of him that called us to glory and virtue. Now, how do we get this knowledge? We study God's word because it is all power. Notice James 1 and verse number 25. Now, if you'll look into the perfect law of liberty, now what is that perfect law of liberty? It's the New Testament. That's where the blessings are. If we'll look in this perfect law of liberty and continue in that perfect law and not be a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man should be blessed in his deeds or deed. And so if I want to be successful, if I want to gain heaven, if I want to be a good asset to God's church, then I'm going to stay in that perfect law of liberty. I'm going to be in that word. I'm not going to be forgetful. I'm not going to leave it behind because I want to be successful and blessed in my deeds. Look with me to the next scripture, Revelations 22, verses 18 and, uh, through 19. John the Revelator brings this to us. For I testify to every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of this book. So he says, pay attention. If any man shall add unto these things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. And if any man shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life, out of the holy city, and from the things which are written in this book. And so it's not my place to add things to God's word. It's not my place to take away from God's word. Christians, those of us that want to be a part of Christ's church, are duty-bound to obey just the New Testament. No additions and no subtractions. Conversion exists outside the church. There's lots of great things that we can do with our co-workers and those neighbors that we have. 
but it also does exist to help in converting souls to the Christ church. Hebrews 4 and verse number 12. Now, there are some great weapons in the arsenals of the world today, but they don't hold the candle to the Word of God because it's quick and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Now, you know there's no weapons today that work on men's conscience and on women's conscience. But the Word of God can convict the vilest people. And so let's use it. It's a tool. It's a great weapon. It's a tool. So in conversion, let's stick to the Word of God. Romans 10 and verse number 17, it has a process to conversion. There's a process to being a true believer, and it is... As the writer says here in verse 17, so then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. And so all good things start, Word of God. You must hear this Word, and this Word, if it is considered properly, will produce faith, a, a motivated faith, a faith that leads us to obedience. Matthew 10 and verse 32 Again, the words of Jesus. Whosoever therefore shall confess me before men, him will I confess also before my Father which is in heaven. If we deny Jesus, he's going to deny us. But a part of our conversion is to confess Jesus before men. Acts 2 and verse 38. Remember how those that had crucified Christ were horrified at their deeds. And they cried out in verse 37, Men and brethren, what shall we do? They were desperate. More desperate than I've probably been. And so Peter says unto those desperate people, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of your sins. You know, their sins had them suppressed tremendously because they had killed the Son of God. But there is remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. You and I can celebrate today because there is remission for what we do that's wrong. There's remission for our sins. First Corinthians 15, verses 1 through 4. The Apostle Paul was all about the gospel. One place he said, I'm not ashamed of it. Here he says, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you. You know, he made a great turn on his road of conversion, and he worked 100% for the gospel of Jesus Christ after that day. He says, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand. It's important. Pay attention to this, by which also ye are saved. If ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless you have believed in vain. Vain is worthless. Let's make sure that we stay in this gospel that's in the New Testament so that we don't believe in vain. He said... <clears throat> For I deliver unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins, according to the Scriptures. Back to the Scriptures. And that he was buried, that he rose again the third day, according to the Scriptures. And so, conversion is very concrete. There is a direct plan. It's not a mystery about conversion in God's church. Romans 6 Verses 3 through 4. Know ye not that so many as of us as were baptized and in Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? We can't be a part of Christ's church if we're not baptized into his death. Therefore we are buried with him by bat baptism into death that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. And so how can I refuse baptism when the Scripture points out so plain that it is a part 
of conversion. Second John verse 9, to disobey and ignore God's plan, his gospel plan, means that we don't have God. Whosoever transgresseth and abideth not in the doctrine of Christ hath not God. He that abideth in the doctrine of Christ, he hath both the Father and the Son. Are there any richer blessings than having both the Father and the Son? So let's be obedient to conversion. Let's spread the gospel to those about us through these through the method of God's conversion. I want to talk a little bit about Christian works, and again, there's no way to cover this in its entirety. But the church exists to help me in those Christian works. There's four points that I want to make about that. It helps us to walk by faith. It helps us in fellowship. You know, I used to didn't think fellowship was very important. It's really important. It helps us to minister to others, and it helps us in comfort. And so, walk by faith. For we walk by faith, not by sight. If we try to walk by physical sight and serve God that way, that's not going to work. It has to be through faith. We're taught that. And so Christ's church helps us walk by faith. It helps us in a method of fellowship. And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. Now, as a young man, I thought it was a law that you had to come to church every time the door was open. And I think that's good, but that's not what it's talking about here. I need to have the desire, the attitude. I need to have the motivation to want to come. I mean, I can make it every time, but I need to have that desire. It's talking about having a love, a commitment, and a desire to be here. And so I feel like in this congregation, we do exhort one another we encourage one another not to provoke. That's kind of harsh. But we exhort one another to love and good works. We ex encourage each other to be here. And I think when we truly love God's church, we want to be here. We may not can make it every time, but we want to be here. First Peter 4 and verse number 11 if any man speak, let him speak as the oracles of God. If any man minister, let him do it as the ability which God giveth, that God in all things may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom be praise and dominion forever and ever. You know, if I give help to the man down on the corner, he may or may not give God glory for that. And so we need to contribute. That's the reason the Bible talks about contributing on the first day of the week. That's really important. Because when the, God, when the church helps the man down on the corner that needs help, God gets all of the credit. And so there needs to be praise and dominion for God and not for me. I'm going to have to back up. I missed a very important part of my lesson. I think I just skimmed right over it. <clears throat> Bear with me for one minute. I 
I wanted to talk some about wearing the uh, putting on Christ. It's Galatians 3, 27 and 28. Sorry about that. I totally missed it. I've got it highlighted here. For as many as of you have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. And I want to stop right there because I used to talk about a nightmare that I had as a first grader of getting on the school bus naked. And it was a horrible nightmare. And so without God's word, we are in trouble. To be naked is in trouble. I'm not going to use that again. I don't like that term. But I do have an experience that happened to me about a month ago where I forgot and I left God in the vehicle. And so I have this dermatology appointment to take this skin knot off of my back. And in April, they couldn't do this surgery because it was elective. And in April, all they did was scan my forehead for temperature, and I got to where I'm used to that. I'm okay with that. But on this day, my dear wife went with me because when you have history of skin problems, you never know what's going to happen. So she was my support. She follows me up to the door. It's locked. I knock on it. The little gal comes out, takes my temperature, and says I'm okay, but she says you've got to wear a mask. And that's where I think I'd left God in the vehicle. I may have left him at home that day. The scripture says put him on. Wear God like we do our clothes so we won't be naked. But I walked up to that door without God. And when the little gal asked me or told me I needed to wear a mask, I basically said why I had notes with me this morning that Latresa says you just kind of bowed up and said mm -mm. and she had this look of on her face y'all that know her know she's easy to read whatever she's got in her mind you can read it and I knew I was in trouble when I saw this look and she says I was bowed up to that young lady about over wearing that mask. Now, I had in my mind that I said, well, maybe you or whatever. But anyway, I wasn't that away. I left God in the vehicle, walk up to the door, and I didn't treat that young lady kindly. Now, she did give me a way out. She said, well, you can just go wait in your vehicle, and I'll come get you when your turn is. And so... I survived, but I didn't feel good about that. I don't feel good about it today. I went back in two weeks to get the stitches out, and I'm apologizing because I left God in the vehicle. And so I have an experience of maybe putting Christ on, but I've forgotten left him. And so let's make sure that as God's people that we put Christ on. And I also want to note the last part of this verse. There is neither Jew nor Greek, there's neither bond nor free, there's neither male nor female, for ye are all one in Christ Jesus. And again, I tried to commend our elders this morning about handling a church function that makes all of us feel comfortable, all of us are pleased, if we are this away and we are of this mind, then we are one in Christ. We are unified and we can worship and we can be proud of the way our church assembly is. And so I am very proud in a godly sense of the way our church assembly is. Sorry that I missed that. That was one of my main points. So I'm looking... For 1 Peter 4 and 11, if any man speak, let him speak as the oracles of God. We need to speak and talk about the Bible, the oracles of God. If any man minister, let him do it as the ability which God giveth. And so that is where I talked about giving and contributing that the man down the street can be blessed by the things that we give. 
John 4 and verse number 1, Brother David Pingerton talked about peace. And there are occasions we need peace. There's families here that have had two services for loved ones just in the near past. There was one the other day for Sister Sarah, and there was good attendance by our membership there for that because the McFarland family needed comfort. And so there are periods of time when we have lots of trouble. And God be thanked that we have brothers and sisters that can bring comfort. Jesus said, believe in God, believe also in me. And so God promises you and I relief, and lots of times that relief comes from our brothers and sisters in Christ church. This is brief, but it needs to be the Lord's Supper, and I'm including worship. And so Christ church exists so that you and I can worship and have the Lord's Supper in the most beneficial way possible. 1 Corinthians 11, verses 23 and 25, you know, this Lord's Supper that we're going to have in a few minutes is very important. It was important to Jesus Christ, and it still is. He's, the Apostle Paul says, I have received of the Lord that which I also delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks for it and said, Jesus said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you this do in remembrance of me. If I'm not wrong, that's the inscription on this communion table in front of us this morning. In remembrance of me. After the same manner also he took the cup which he had supped, or saying, This cup is the New Testament of my blood, this do ye as oft as ye drink it in remembrance of me. And so our assembly is a great encouragement to you and I as we have communion. Let's notice oh man, Matthew 18 and verse number 20. This talks about Christ's promise to all Christians. He says, for where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. Now, we've used this to talk about communion. There needs to be two or three. Maybe so. But Jesus Christ wasn't just talking about communion. He says, wherever two or three are gathered in my name, we're gathered in Christ's name this morning. Where there are two or three, then I am in the midst of them. What a privilege it is to have a worship service and have Jesus promising to be a part of that service. 1 Corinthians 11 and verse 33, Wherefore, my brethren, when you come together to eat, tarry one for another. And so this was instruction by Paul, and he was having to straighten out problems that were in the church. He was gifted in that manner of bringing solutions. And so those dear People had been coming together and maybe not waiting on each other. They were coming together just to have a feast. And so he says, Terry, one for another, wait on the other one. Be patient, be kind, be humble, be considerate that God's unity can prevail. Acts 20 and verse number 7. And upon the first day of the week, when are we to have communion? The first day of the week. When the disciples came together to break bread, Paul preached unto them, ready to depart on the morrow and continue his speech until midnight. We're not going to midnight. I have one more scripture and we will conclude. So there was preaching. There was communion. There was prayer. There's singing. We're told to sing with the spirit and the understanding. Acts 2 and verse 42 is the conclusion of our lesson. Pay particular attention here. Christ's church continued steadfast. It's of no value if we don't continue. 
We've got to continue steadfast in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship. I used to not like the word fellowship, but as this pandemic has raged, I like it more. It is included here right along with the apostles' doctrine. And so together, the fellowship to assemble is very important. And I've heard many of you talk about how important. We didn't know it was that important. It was kind of commonplace. But it's important that we can fellowship, and then the next thing is in breaking of bread and in prayers. We are truly blessed. Let's continue in those assembly. That's the wrong word, but let's continue in Christ's church. Let's support it. Let's support our eldership. Let's support our deacons. Let's support each other in all aspects of Jesus Christ wanted us to be as far as being a part of God's family. That concludes our lesson this morning. God's invitation is always before us. If you're subject this morning to that gospel call, which would be to obey that gospel, then we are here. The church is here to help and serve you. Or if you're here this morning and the prayers would benefit you, please come as we stand and sing. Number 881, Room at the Cross. <clears throat> of our service where we're going to take the Lord's Supper. We're here to remember the fact that God had to take on flesh and blood for us to be saved. Before we start, I'd like to ask uh, if anybody needs an individual serving, if you didn't get one, if you'll raise your hand, a deacon will bring you a serving real quick. I want to remind us as we partake of this that this is definitely not a permanent situation that we're doing this. Um, this is for obviously for the craziness that's happening right now and uh, as has been said many times our desire is to get back to normal as soon as possible. So this is definitely not a permanent situation. Also want to say that I'm going to do it a little bit different this morning. Um, after I offer thanks for the bread what I'm going to do is I'm just going to sit down here on this front pew and I'm going to partake with you and I'm going to give about two minutes or so. I'm going to set my, my clock 
for about two minutes and that way it will give you time to not just do the physical act of, of eating the bread and drinking the fruit of the vine, but it'll also give you time to meditate and to really think about the Lord. So I'll give a little bit of time uh, for you to, to think about it and I'll get back up for the, for the fruit of the vine. So I want to turn into Matthew chapter 27. If you get your Bibles out, I want to turn to Matthew 27. I want to read here several verses um, about the crucifixion and the trial of Jesus. I'm going to start in Matthew 27. I'm going to begin in verse 1, and I'm going to kind of skip through here and, and read several places. In Matthew 27, beginning in verse 1, the scripture says this, When the morning was come, all the chief priests and elders of the people took counsel against Jesus to put him to death. That was their purpose. That's what they were there for, was to put Jesus to death. And, of course, this was um, fulfilling the plan that had been established from the, from the foundation of the earth. In verse 2, it says, And when they had bound him, they led him away and delivered him to Pontius Pilate, the governor. Then Judas, which had betrayed him, when he, wa when he saw that he was condemned, repented himself and brought again the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and elders, saying, I have sinned and that I have betrayed the innocent blood. And they said, What is that to us? See thou to it. And he cast down the pieces of silver in the temple and departed and went and hanged himself. And the chief priest took the silver pieces and said, It is not lawful for, uh, to put them in the treasury because it is the price of blood. And they took counsel and bought with them the potter's field to bury strangers in, wherefore that field was called the field of blood unto this day. Then was fulfilled that which was spoken by Jeremy the prophet, saying, And they took the thirty pieces of silver and the price of him that was valued, whom they of the children of Israel did value, and they gave them for the potter's field as the Lord appointed me. In verse 11 it says, And Jesus stood before the governor, and the governor asked him, saying, Art thou the king of the Jews? And Jesus said unto him, Thou sayest. And when he was accused of the chief priests and elders, he answered nothing. Then said Pilate unto him, Hearest thou not how many things they witness against thee? Or in other words, Pilate said, Don't you hear all the stuff that they're saying about you? And he, verse 14, Jesus answered him never a word, insomuch that the gover governor marveled greatly. Now at that feast, the governor was wont to release unto the people a prisoner whom they would. And they had then a notable prisoner, prisoner called Barabbas. Therefore, when they gathered together, Pilate said unto them, whom will ye that I release unto you, Barabbas, or Jesus, which is called Christ? For he knew that for envy they had delivered him. When he was set down on the judgment seat, his wife sent unto him, saying, Have thou nothing to do with this just man, for I have suffered many things this day in a dream because of him. But the chief priests and elders persuaded the multitude that they should ask Barabbas and destroy Jesus. The governor answered and said unto them, whether the twain will ye that I release unto you? And they said, Barabbas. Pilate said unto them, What shall I do then with Jesus, which is called Christ? And they all said unto him, Let him be crucified. And the governor said, Why? What evil hath he done? But they cried out the more, saying, Let him be crucified. When Pilate saw that he could prevail nothing, but rather that a tumult was made, he took water and washed his hands before the multitude, saying, I am innocent of the blood of this just person, see to it. Then answered all the people and said, His blood be on us and our children. Then released he Barabbas unto them, and when he had scourged Jesus, he delivered him to be crucified. Then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the common hall and gathered unto him the whole band of soldiers, and they stripped him and put on him a scarlet robe. And when they had plaited a crown of thorns, they put it upon his head, and they read in his right hand, and they bowed the knee before him and mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews. And they spit on him, and they took the reed, and they smote him on the head. And after that they had mocked him, they took the robe off him and put on his own raiment, and they led him away to be crucified. And as they came out, they found a man of Cyrene, Simon by name. Him they compelled to bear his cross. And when they were coming to a place called Golgotha, that is to say, a place of a skull, they gave him vinegar to drink mingled with gall. And, we had, and when he had tasted thereof, he would not drink. And they crucified him and parted his garments, casting lots, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophet. They parted my garments among them, and upon my vesture did they cast lots. And sitting down, they watched him there. And set up over his head uh, his accusation written, 
This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. Then were there two thieves crucified with him, one on the right hand and another on the left. And they, pa and they that passed by reviled him, wagging their heads, and saying, Thou that destroyed the temple and built it in three days, save yourself. If you be the Son of God, come down from the cross. Likewise, also the chief priests mocking him with the scribes and elders said, He saved others, him, him, uh, himself he cannot save. If he be the king of Israel, let him now come down from the cross, and he, we will believe him. He trusted in God, let him deliver him now, if he will have him, for he said, I am the son of God. The thieves also which were crucified with him cast the same in his teeth. Now from the sixth hour there was darkness over all the land unto the ninth hour, and about the ninth hour Jesus cried with a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, that is to say, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Some of them that stood there when they heard that said, this man called for Elias. And straightway one of them ran and took a sponge and filled it with, the, with vinegar and put, a re, and put it on a reed and gave him to drink. The rest said, let be, let us see whether Elias will come to save him. Jesus, when he cried again with a loud voice, yielded up the ghost, and behold, the veil of the temple was rent in twain from the top to the bottom, and the earth did quake and the rocks rent. Skipping to verse 57, when the even was come, there came a rich man of Arimathea named Joseph, whom, who also himself was Jesus' disciple. He went to Pilate and begged the body of Jesus. Then Pilate commanded the body to be delivered. And when Joseph had taken the body, he wrapped it in a clean linen cloth and laid it in his own new tomb, which he had hewn out in the rock. And he rolled a great stone to the door of the sepulcher and departed. And there was Mary Magdalene and the other Mary sitting over against the sepulcher. Now the next day that followed, the day of preparation, the chief priest and the Pharisees came together unto Pilate, saying, Sir, we remember that the deceiver said, While he was yet alive, after three days I will rise again. Rise again. Command, therefore, that the sepulcher be made sure until the third day, lest his disciples come by night and steal him away, and say unto the people, He is risen from the dead, so the last error shall be worse than the first. So Pilate said unto them, You have a watch, go your way, make it sure as you can. So they went and made the sepulcher sure, sealing the stone and setting a watch. So in this chapter, of course, we read about the, the death and the suffering of our Lord. And we have incredible detail here in Matthew chapter 27. And this is what the Lord's Supper is about, is about us remembering his death. But it wasn't just that Jesus died. That's not, that is important, and that was absolutely necessary, but the resurrection is important also. I want to read in chapter 28, just 10 verses here. It says, in the end of the Sabbath, as it began to dawn toward the first day of the week, came Mary Magdalene and the other Mary to see the sepulcher. And behold, there was a great earthquake from the angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat upon it. His countenance was, li was like lightning, and his raiment white as snow. And for fear of him, the keepers did shake and became as dead men. And the angel answered and said unto the women, Fear not ye, for I know that ye seek Jesus, which was crucified. He is not here, for he is risen, as he said, Come see the place where the Lord lay. And go quickly and tell his disciples that he is risen from the dead, and behold, he goeth before you into Galilee. There shall you see him, lo, I have told you. And they departed quickly from the sepulcher with fear and great joy and did run to bring his disciples word. And as they went to tell the disciples, behold, Jesus met them, saying, All hail. And they came and held him by the feet, and they worshipped him. Then Jesus said unto them, Be not afraid. Go tell my brethren that they go into Galilee, and there they shall see me. And that is the true hope that we have is that, that our Lord died for us, that he, his body went through the suffering that it went through, and that his blood was shed so that we could be saved. But also that God showed him the paths of life, as was prophesied in Psalm 16, and that he did come back to life and that he was resurrected. And as he told the disciples there, he said, go and tell them that they will come and they will be able to see me. And that's what we all hope for as Christians today is the fact that we know he died for us, that he sits at God's right hand, and that we're waiting for the day for him to come back and for us to see him in his glory again. As we partake of the bread, we remember Jesus's body. We remember the torture that he went through for every single one of us. And as we partake of the fruit of the vine, 
we remember that blood that was spilled. Let's offer thanks at this time for, for the bread. Father, we thank you so much today for this memorial that we have that you've set up for us, Father. We thank you for the simplicity of this. We thank you for, um, to, to leave it for us, Father, so that we can remember Jesus. Help us, Father, as we partake of this bread, that we will truly remember what Jesus went through for each and every one of us, that he went through the trial that he went through and that he went through it all alone, Father, and that he died so that we could be saved. Help us as we partake of this bread in remembrance of his body and to do it in a way that would please you. We thank you so much for Jesus and we pray it through his name. Amen. As Lyle read for us in the lesson this morning, after he partook of the bread, he took of the fruit of the vine also. Let us offer thanks at this time for, for the blood of Christ. Father, again, we continue our thanks for this memorial and for this time that we can remember Jesus. Father, help our minds to be focused, to be centered truly on Jesus, and to be focused on what he did for each one of us. Father, we thank you that he left heaven, that he came to this earth, and that he took on flesh and blood so that he could accomplish the purpose that was set up before any of us were ever created, before the world was created. We thank you, Father, for, for your plan and, and for Jesus and for everything that was done to accomplish this, and we thank you for his willingness because, Father, we know it was not easy for him, but we, we know he was willing, Father, and we know that... He did it so that each of us could be reconciled with you. Help us as we partake of this fruit of the vine, Father. Help us to remember that blood that was spilled out. But as the, the soldier shoved his spear into our Lord's side and as it was pulled out and as that blood poured out, Father, that our, our redemption was sealed with that and that if we'll accept it, Father, that we can have that sacrifice for us and we can stand before you whole. We thank you again, Father, for this fruit of the vine. We pray it through Jesus' name. Amen.
as we take of the bread and as we drink of the fruit of the vine, that's what the Lord's Supper is. That's what, that's what Jesus said whenever he instituted it. That's what Paul talks about in 1 Corinthians 11. That is the Lord's Supper. We also have another uh, duty that God uh, asks of us, and that's to lay by and store on the first day of the week. And again, we'll do that in the same way we've been doing for the last couple of Sundays. There's little white boxes at the front doors here, and they're by the back doors also. There's four different boxes, so if you want to leave your contribution in those boxes, we'll take care of it in that way. Again, want to say thanks to everybody for being flexible, of sitting in different spots, and uh, sitting maybe where you're not very comfortable or, or whatever. We, we appreciate that, and with being here early as well. Uh, remember, we will have a service this evening. This will be our first Sunday evening service in quite a few weeks. Uh, again, we ask that you be early so we can have everybody seated. Um, I'm going to ask Brother Rob Lindsay in just a second to lead us in a dismissal prayer. Um, after the prayer, as we've been doing, as, as Gerald said at the beginning, after that prayer, if you'll stay in your seats and Thomas will lead us in another song. And for those who do want to go ahead and leave during that song, you can go ahead and leave and, and to beat the crowd and not to be uh, shoulder to shoulder with people uh, to be able to get out during that time. I believe that's everything. God bless everybody, and Lord willing, we'll see you this evening. I'll ask Brother Lot, Rob if he'll come to lead us in prayer. If you'll go ahead and stand, please. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we're so thankful to you for being able to assemble together after being apart for so long, and we just have taken for granted the opportunity we have from the fellowship of the saints. Thank you that we could be together to encourage and edify one another and to hear your word proclaimed. And we thank you for uh, reminding us again about how special it is and how privileged we are to call upon you as our Father to be your children. And for Jesus making it all possible, and thank you that we could take part in this communion service to remember again what Jesus did to make it possible that we could be forgiven of our sins to have an everlasting home with you in heaven, but to be part of this spiritual family that is Christ church. Thank you for watching over and blessing us, be with those that are ill and fighting disease. And we just pray your blessing on those that are grieving at this time. Watch over and bless us as we depart from this place and help us to come back and be again a part of this opportunity to give praise and thanks to you for all your many wonders and glories, all the wonderful gifts you, you've given to us, but especially for the gift of Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior. We pray all this in his name. Amen. 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 Number 460, I love my Savior too. Oh, get up, I have a king.